Probably. Say that again, so, please. <laughs> I wanted to touch on Destiny and Fate because in the readings, you like kind of touch on it. On, so on what? I, on Fate? On like Destiny and Fate. Yeah, we will. We will talk about that. Yes. Is he, is he one of those people that believe that you're like Destiny is laid out for you and like whatever you do, is, it's going to amount to that no matter what? So Destiny comes in redemption, even though he talks about it here a little bit. So we'll talk about that, right? Is it something laid out or is it something that you know, you create, right? Yeah. We'll, we'll find out, <laughs> we'll find out. So uh, just to summarize for the recording, cause I forgot to turn it on. <laughs> so the three gates, right? Maybe now you can write it down. <laughs> now you were listening eagerly, that was nice. Now write it down, um, right? We, we live according to Hosen's five, we live on the surface of our lives, right? Most of us do not penetrate into the deeper um, abundance that we could have, right? That's the gate of creation is the gate of abundance. Most of us don't touch all of the things we were meant to have. Most of us miss our true selves. This is the gate of revelation that we'll talk about today. And most of us miss our destinies, right? This is the gate of redemption that we'll talk about next time. So we live kind of, you know, superficial lives, kind of walking the path that is already scripted for us. Most of us are slightly miserable, but not too miserable, right? But we're not, <laughs> we're not like, we're kind of in this lukewarm place where we're kind of happy, but not really, right? So, and Hosen Shaikh saying, no, we need to, the reason we're like this is we're on the surface in the lukewarm waters, right? We need to go deeper into our lives. And that's how we're going to get into these um, uh, deeper experiences. So, to, so last time, just to review, we did the gate of creation or the gate of abundance, right? And does anybody remember what are the two things, two position, uh, positions we have to take in order to access that gate? There were two things, two wrong prayers that we needed to pray differently in order to access the gate. Yes. The prayer of the sinner and the okay, very good. So prayer of the sinner, what is, a, what is the sinner missing? Or what is that prayer missing? Anybody remember? <clears throat> What is the prayer of the sinner? Yes. I want to be grateful for you. Okay, exactly. Right? You are in the scarcity. You don't have, you're missing this and that. You are not in the gate of abundance, right? You have a mentality of scarcity and you will stay in the scarcity in that sense, right? In order to get to the abundance that is waiting for you, you have to uh, shift the attitude to gratitude, which brings you crosses the threshold into the abundance right so to be grateful is already to be in abundance right i love every i love my life right i i'm grateful for whatever i have been given everything that i have is right i mean i'm seeing it the sinner doesn't see the abundance that is already in his life right so he misses it and he misses the abundance that could come in right were he to cross the threshold right there is really a threshold to be crossed to access more abundance right remember the the very famous words or infamous words of jesus to whom who has more will be given and he who doesn't have even that will be taken away that's he's talking about this gate right <clears throat> okay magician how's the magician now what's the prayer of the magician yes he wants to change his own gate Okay, he wants to force things, grab things, take things, bully things, right? He wants to bully the universe into giving him what he wants, right? And there's so many ways we bully the universe, right? We steal, we cheat, we lie on our applications, we, right? we manipulate, we are violent, we are coercive, right? These are all the ways that we manipulate reality, try to, we are doing magic, right? We are trying to bend reality to our will, right? These are all the forms of manipulation, of violence, of dishonesty, right? That we are trying to bend reality to our will. When we are in that vector, when we are going in that direction, we miss the gates of creation. Why? Because we are not in an attitude of receptivity. We're in an attitude of grasping. If you're not receptive, you cannot receive. And so all the gifts that are waiting to be given cannot be given because you are not receiving, you are grabbing. You see the difference, right? So you miss the gate of, uh, again, the gate of creation. Everybody clear on the first gate? Okay. Did y'all practice? I had a good one this morning where I lost my gate. Uh, with, I retreated outside of my gate. I had to do all kinds of, you know, mind acrobatics to get back. So it's, it's not something permanent, right? We go in and ah, we come right back. Ah, my leg sucks. And then you come back. <laughs> so there's, it's, it's a discipline. It's a kind of real, it's, a, it's an exercise, right? To continuously go back through the gate, right? Of creation. Okay. So today the gate of revelation. Now I'm, I'm going to teach this on two levels as I always do. 
right? Obviously, there is a religious level, revelation of God, right? But for those of us who <laughs> are not into that, um, we're going to see that actually this revelation of God is synonymous to, with the revelation of the true self, right? So this revelation of God is something that we all have. You can call it God or you can call it, right, the voice of your higher self. It doesn't matter. This is an experience Rosenzweig is describing with religious terms, but it is a universal experience. So I will try to describe it in terms that everyone can relate to. Um, okay, so I'll start with his approach, right, the notion of God. And then I'll, I'll re-explain it, I'll translate it into a, an experience that all of you can relate to. Um, so first of all, he, he observes, okay, once we have crossed the gate of creation, we're a little bit more open, right? Remember, each gate is an opening also. Make sure you get this, right? Every gate is a broadening, enlarging of yourself, right? Um, gate of creation, you're a little more enlarged because you see outside of you the abundance, right? So you're already... Okay, you're able to, your head is coming out of the water of your despair, but <laughs> you're seeing all oh, the sky, the birds, you know, people and so forth, right? So you're a little bit more open, but says Rosenzweig, you're still locked up within your own life. In, in the gate of creation, you're not yet really uh, in contact with transcendence, with otherness. You're still locked up in your universe, right? You're still thinking of your life, of your abundance, of you know, everything that is revolving around you. Oh, I have this, I have that, I have this. Still, I, 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 <laughs> right? So the gate of creation, yes, it's a step uh, beyond the despair, which is completely locked up, right? When you're in despair, by the way, I don't know if you experienced this, but when I get into despair, uh, the colors, like I was, um, I've, I've sat in a coffee shop in despair. I barely see people around me. I don't know how, it's, how it is for you, but when you're in depressed, you don't see people. <laughs> you see shadows moving, right? You don't really, you can't zoom in on people, right? You barely see what's going on around you when you're in despair. You're completely locked up, right? When you become grateful, you start to see a little more, but it's still just you and your, what you, your life, right? So Moving to a deeper uh, opening is this gate, right, of revelation. Yes. Oh, I just want to say I find it shocking that I find out what I'm doing. Like, okay. Like, I don't want that. Like, I feel like everyone around me is just like, go away. And I'm not that type of person. Usually when I get super sad, it's like, I don't want to be I don't know if that's sadness or just um, <laughs> you're just um, um, on edge and it's different. <laughs> Right, right, right. It's a little different experience, but yeah, similar. People, in any case, we don't see the people. In the first case, they're invading there. We want them out. In the second case, we don't see them, right? So, okay. So today we're going to go into this deeper opening, right? Which is the gate of revelation. So so he says something, right? So, so let's read the quote where he says that the gate of creation is still very much, there's still no uh, true experience of otherness, right? We are still alone. Right, he says this here on page um, 173. Um, okay. Uh, yes, last paragraph. Here begins, who is with me? Uh, wave at me if you're there. Last paragraph on 173. I need two waves, one wave, second wave. That's it, just one person with me, Sanchez. <laughs> no, okay, <laughs> thank you, Beth. Okay, here begins a supplement, which is the revelation of God merely ushered in uh, in the acts of creation of which we spoke about. In order to retrieve the factuality of God, which risks being lost in its hidden nature, we must not stay at his first revelation in an infinity full of creative acts. The key here is there, God threatened to be lost again behind the infinity of creation. Okay, if we stick to creation, we're going to see only the gifts and we lose God, <laughs> right? So we, we tend to forget the giver behind the gift. So here we are trying to magnetize the gifts, right? And he's saying, you know, this, is, this has been the problem of most religious philosophies, right? They see God as the first cause and that's it, right? Then we're left to our own devices. So make sure you write down, right, that most religions or world philosophies, right, see God as the first cause. God creates the laws of the universe, says Aristotle, and then he recedes in the background, right? So, and then we're all left to our own devices. So most religions see God started the thing and then God is somewhere up there, right? And we are left to our own devices in the world. So most philosophies, religions uh, admit that there is a creation, that God has made a move, right? But then they all say God then waits 
releases us in the world and we are left to our own devices. This is the God of the Greeks, right? If in the Greek mindset, God creates, he's the first cause, and then we are left to our own devices, right? So he says, uh, in the context of Hebrew thought, right? God, in a way, trespasses his over this territory of human free will and human agency, right? God does, it's not enough that God makes the first cause, he's gonna go in and meddle with everything, right? So the Greeks would be horrified. The Greeks like the idea, God creates the, the world, then leaves us to our own devices, we are free. In the Hebrew context, God is constantly stepping, overstepping his boundaries, interfering, say, meddling, right? And so forth. And so that's what he's saying, you know, at one point God has to break his silence and reveal himself directly to the soul right that's the gate of revelation in religious terms right so let me say that again right the gate of revelation in religious wording is god revealing himself directly to the human soul it's not just through the gifts it's directly okay so we might wonder okay how <laughs> how does this work right how how does God do this, right? Religiously and even on a secular level. If this is a general human experience, what does it mean that God reveals himself to the human soul? And here, Rosenzweig is going to say something very interesting, which I think will resonate with every single person in this room. He says, God reveals himself through a question that all of us here at some point in our lives in our innermost depths. Okay, let me say that again, right? So God reveals himself through a question that all of us are going to hear at some point in our minds, in our hearts. And this we know is the voice of God because it draws us back to our true selves, right? It is a question, which is a question about our true selves. And the question is this, where are you, right? So I want you to write down this question, where are you, right? I think we might even do an exercise today. <laughs> where you're going to write a little bit where you are. You're going to try to answer this question, right? I'm very curious what could come up with this. But let me talk a little bit about it, and then we'll do the exercise, right? So this is a question that resonates every so often um, when we have lost our connection with our deeper self. I don't know how many of you have experienced this. This is usually when you start to become burnt out or depressed or angry, and your emotions are out of balance. And at that moment, the question should emerge, where am I? Or who have I become, right? Where, how did I become this person, right? Where is the self I used to be, right? Where is the joy I used to have? Where is the passion I used to have, right? Where is the love I used to have, right? This is the question, where are you, right? The moment that question emerges in your heart, is actually the moment of profound revelation. This is actually God, according to Rosenzweig, asking you this question. And you can say, it's God or my higher self. It doesn't matter. It's an experience we all share, right? So um, so this is the, the first question, right? And of course, how we respond to that question, we're going to connect with God or not, right? Or we're going to connect to our true self or not, right? And uh, Rosenzweig says that the proper answer which, which is some of us are able to do, some of us are struggling to do, is here I am, right? I am open, I am willing, I am ready to listen to how far I have strayed from myself. And I'm willing, and this is key, to change course, to return back to who I was. By the way, in the Hebrew, this is a fabulous um, connection. In the Hebrew, the word for repentance is literally to return. Uh, shuv. Shuv is, oh, sorry. Uh, shuv. And this is the word in Hebrew, shuv, which means to repent, translated to repent in the Bible, right? Literally means to return. Return to what? Return to where are you? Return to your true self, right? That is the meaning of repentance. Repentance is not some fancy thing like, you know, um, you know, I, I, I need to, um, follow these religious principles, I need to right, do right by God. No, repentance or to return is simply recovering your true self that you have lost somewhere along the way. <laughs> and now you're burnt out, now you're angry, now you're lost, now you're in despair. And why? Because somewhere along the way, you lost the connection to your true self. And so the proper answer, according to Rosenzweig, if you want to cross the gate of revelation, right, is not enough to hear the question to cross the gate. 
you have to be open to what that question is the answer. You have to be willing to say, here I am. I am willing to hear where I took that wrong turn. What did I, where did I go wrong? Why am I, when, when did I start losing my integrity, right? When did I start uh, selling myself, right? When did I start and so forth. At that moment, when you say, here I am, I'm willing to hear, you are now crossing into the gate of revelation. And at that moment, you're beginning to reconnect to your true self. You're ready for the return or the act of repentance uh, in the Hebrew context. So let's, let's look at the text here. Uh, where he says all this, <clears throat> uh, page 189. Any questions so far or um, comments about the gate of revelation? Okay. Okay, 189. Um, yes. <clears throat> Second paragraph, wave at me if you're there. One wave, faithful Sanchez and Bell. Okay, good. <clears throat> okay, where are you? This is the question, right? This is nothing else but the question about the you. Not a question about the essence of the you for the moment is not even within our range of vision and so forth. And then he continues, last line, right? The eye discovers itself at the moment where it affirms the existence of the you through the question about where it is. It discovers itself and not the you. There's a little jab at Boober here, right? The, he's, he's, this is not the IU relationship we talked about, right? This is recovering oneself, right? The, the, the you of God questions, where are you? And at that moment, the answer is here I am, right? I've lost myself. Let's see where I've jumbled this up, right? So that's the first thing, right? And then we have um, page 190. Um, and then we have, let's go to uh, the last sentence of the first paragraph to God's question. Are you there? Wave at me if you're there. One, two, okay. To God's question, where are you? The man still remained a you as a defined, obstinate self when called by name twice with the strongest fixity of purpose to which one cannot remain deaf. The man, and this is the, the, the proper reaction, right? The man totally open, totally unfolded, totally ready, totally so now answers here I am so what does it mean that here I am and then we're going to go and look at practically what does this look like in our lives right we're going to talk about that a little bit um, but first let's see what he says here is the eye the individual human eye still totally now make sure you get this receptive opened empty without content without essence pure readiness pure obedience all ear okay that's the moment you cross the gate of revelation, when you're able to hear that question and to begin the soul searching that that question is leading to, right? Okay, that question of where was I, right? Okay, so let's stop a little bit and comment a little bit on that. Okay, what does it mean? Can you give me some concrete experience? How many have experienced the gate of revelation, first of all? How many have heard this question <laughs> at some point? Uh, just one, one more. How many of you have heard this question? Where are you? Okay, tell us a little bit. What does it sound like for those of us who haven't yet, or who have probably heard it, but don't know, <laughs> all of us are supposed to have heard it, right? So what does it look like? Let me start, maybe let's go down the road. Um, Gonzalez, you're passing, <laughs> okay. Uh, who else raised their hand, Watson? <laughs> um, in terms of what it looks like to me, when I hear the question of like, where am I? I kind of like <laughs> self-reflect on like, what's going on in my life like currently, so it tends to look empty and like dark because then when I hear the question like where am I I'm kind of in like that depressed like the depressing stage so that's what it looks like it's just kind of empty and like foggy to me. okay very good right usually when you hear that question you've gone far away already <laughs> from where you are right question comes when you're not there right so it will be kind of a foggy kind of a painful question right um, good. Yes, Nor. <clears throat> um, I was going to say that I feel like rather than hearing the question, where are you? I typically more often hear people say that they're lost. Mm -hmm. And it's funny using that terminology, usually not in a literal <clears throat> sense of I feel lost. Mm -hmm. Very and good. So I guess that was what I would think. Of That's the implicit question, you? right? I feel lost, meaning part of you is like, where am I? 
how did I get here? I'm lost, right? Absolutely. There, do you see how all of us are hearing this question? It's very powerful. This is, by the way, one of the most, um, most uh, when God is speaking, he uses this question a lot. If you read the biblical narrative, he's asking this question several times. Where are you? Uh, first time when, if you recall the biblical text, of when Adam and Eve take the apple, remember what's, what's God's first words to them? Is it, ah, you sinned, let me bless you out of the universe. It, what does he say? Where are you? right where have you gone where i don't follow <laughs> right cain kills his brother what does god say ah it's interesting it's a little different Anybody remember yeah where is your brother <laughs> right again the word where right several times right god is asking specific targeting individuals of, of usually personalities right in the text and then asking them where are you so it's very interesting because we are used to hearing god you know he's coming and he's going to come with fire and brimstone and wipe out evil from the earth no god actually is very curious <laughs> right where are you <laughs> where have you gone where have you been right it's it's a very uh, interesting uh, is it's, it's not this the typical approach we assign to god which is ah he's going to judge us for our wrongdoings right and then punish us for our trespasses and we have to repent or we'll go to hell right no god actually is very curious where are you <laughs> right trying to start a conversation actually right usually when you ask a question like that you you would like to start a conversation um how many of you uh, watch um, Manifest, that show that just got new <laughs> episodes? Thank God. Yes. Okay. Uh, have you have you seen the part where, you know, the guy who's empathetic and he's reading everybody. Okay, anyway, there's a guy in there. He's empathetic. He reads everyone's emotions and he has a wife. And so he asks his wife, how are you doing? And the wife is like, I'm okay. And he's like, listen, when I ask you that question, it's that I already know you're not okay. And I'm trying to start a conversation. Do you remember this? <laughs> right? um, and, she, and so then she breaks down and she tells him, right? So it's the same thing with God, right? If he's asking the question, where are you? He knows exactly where you are. He's not asking you because he doesn't know. He's asking to start a conversation. What happened? Tell me. Let's talk about this, right? So it's a very different kind of God than we're used to, who's kind of on a throne, you know, dictating and, you know, throwing thunderbolts on people who sin, right? This is very different. This is a God who's like, let, let's talk about this. Let, let's, let me see what's going on. So, okay, where are you? Very good. So that's, I'm lost, is the variation on the question, where are you? Anybody else have that experience? Tell us a little bit. I think there were some hands here. Romero, go ahead. Where are you? The experience of where are you? <laughs> in terms of like specific pain i can't really say like a specific plane um i mean i did have like one encounter where i was talking with someone that used to know me when i was like uh in like middle school and they talked about how they saw me and how they viewed me and how i was back then and i realized like i'm no longer like that um i don't think wrong with that i i realized like i would say that would be something but i realized like just now thinking about that well i was like well I don't necessarily want to go back to that person. So that's not necessarily like a moment of where are you, but it's also like it wasn't really coming from God. It was coming from someone that I really don't want to like associate with anymore. Um, I feel like for me, when I, I go through like that, I used to go through that a lot where I would go through those like very uh, like depressed, like, you know, blows. And I think like, for example, like last year I like went through that and I think when I kind of sit there and like feel weak and I feel like, well, I'm not strong anymore. I feel that like I don't have control over anything in my life. I think that's when I usually kind of sit there and I don't say necessarily, where are we? I feel like I usually just like, I, I feel like I usually say, who are we? Like, right. Or where are you, God? <laughs> another, right another question. Okay, good. Very good. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Now here's a trickier question. What would here I am look like? Let's go back to those who talked about it. If, what would it look like to say to that question, which you felt, right? Here I am. What would it look like? Let's see if you can cross the gate. Let's, 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 let's cross the gate with Watson really quick. <laughs> um, can you come back to me? Yes. Nora, you're next. <laughs> what would it sound like to those people who are saying, I'm lost? What would it sound like to say to yourself or to respond, here I am? What would that look like? So we know where the, where are you, right? We've all experienced this, but what would it, now this part, we haven't experienced necessarily, but here I am, what would it look like? It's just being honest about, well, I don't know if, if everybody really knows the answer to that question. <laughs> no, you don't know it right away because you're, you're lost, right? So uh, it's, 
it's not an answer, right? It's here I am is not an answer. Remember, he's talking about, uh, we, we read it, right? Here I am is pure readiness, pure obedience, all ear. There's no answers, right? It's something so else. I guess she's open to finding out. Exactly, right? Open to, and more specifically, open to changing course. And this is something we're often not ready, right? We've gone too far, we tell ourselves, right? This has happened to me. I went down a path. At one point, where are you pops up. And I'm like, well, I made the bed. I'm going to sleep in it. <laughs> I continue. Lost 10 years of my life. You know? <laughs> so, right. So um, this is this is very often. Right. We it's not just that we don't we hear the where are you. We hear where we should go. Right. Most of us know how to get back to our true selves. We hear the answer. But we're so far in. Right. Of we made certain promises. Or we're gonna look stupid now, right? Or we're going to, you know, look weak, and we look, and, and we we struggle to turn back, right? And the text is saying, this is the gate. If to to get to the gate, you have to not only hear, you have to be willing to turn around, right? And very often, we don't want, we feel either it's impossible or we're gonna look stupid, <laughs> right? Or, but most of us really feel it's impossible to change course. And that's the problem, right? It's never impossible to change course, right? That's, by the way, how many of you know the song Hotel California? Okay, one, two, three, good. I remember in my school, it was banned. And, <laughs> and what's interesting is that everybody started to play it in every corner of the school, like on the guitar and everywhere I would go, someone would be on the piano playing it or on the guitar. It became the biggest hit, right? That's what happens when you ban music in, in uh, teenagers' high school. So anyways, that song has a very interesting um, uh, refrain where it says, you can check out anytime you want, but you can never leave, remember? Right, so the story of the song is somebody gets stuck in a kind of a haunted hotel, right? And, you know, they're kind of, you know, their spirits, and I mean, it's a crazy place, but it's also kind of, you know, a sexy place. So anyways, they're there and they're kind of enjoying themselves. And one day they think, you know, I, I, this is weird, I need to leave. And they, they try to rush out and the guy, the guy, you know, the counter, the hotel guy, what do you call it, the hotel clerk? The guy who's the concierge. the concierge or I'll tell him, tells him, go, go. You can check out anytime you want, but just know this. You can never leave this hotel. Once you're in it, you're stuck. This is a very profound song, actually. This is a very profound song about a very profound lie that we buy into. We believe when I've gone too far in this direction, there is no turning back. And that's what the song is singing about. This feeling we have when we've gone too far in a certain direction that we cannot turn back, that we can only check out, but we can't turn back. This is a lie, right? According to Rosenzweig, that we can always leave, right? It is always possible to turn around and leave, right? And the gate of redemption is waiting, sorry, the gate of revelation is waiting, right? Beckoning for us to turn around and, and you know, just start over. Right, but it's often hard because we've brought people so far, we've made certain commitments, right? Or we're gonna look stupid and we feel we've gone too far. Text is saying, no, at any point you can turn back to your true self, right? You can hear that voice and be open to it, right? Um, <clears throat> okay, there is a story in the Hebrew Bible which uh, talks about um, the resistance we often have to leaving, right, to turning. Uh, and uh, Rosenzweig compares that person to the hero, the Greek hero. You're not familiar with the Greek classics like he was, but how many of you know the story of Oedipus? Um, so he ends up, he's destined to, what is it, kill his father? Somebody help me. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, he's destined to kill his dad and, and have kids with his mom. Okay, and then he tries to avoid it, I think, Well, right? his parents try to kill him, and okay. that doesn't work. The okay. servant lets him get away. And then his adoptive parents keep it a secret from him okay. all those years until he goes to a um, uh, future seer, and they tell him, well, that's what you're destined to do. He thinks the adoptive parents are his real parents, so he's like, I gotta run away. And he just leads him back to his real parents to Very do, good. fulfill the prophecy. This is typical Greek. This is the word you guys were struggling with, Moira, M-O-I-R-A, destiny, right? You were talking about that, right? It, this is the, in Greek thought, when you're like destined to do something, you're going to end up doing it. There is no turning back. Once you've started this direction, there is no turning back. This is Greek thought, right? And Rosenzweig here is, is, is uh, confronting this thought with, with Hebrew thought and saying, no, there is always a point where you can turn back, right? There is never a fixed destiny, right? You can at any moment, right? Whatever karma you've accumulated or whatever bad luck you've accumulated or family curses you're carrying, whatever it is, right? 
you can always turn back, right? No matter how far you've messed up, right? You can always turn back. That's the gate of revelation, right? That, that he's contrasting it to the Greek view that once you've entered that course, you stuck. Hotel California, right? So that's Moira. Moira is the destiny you cannot get out of, right? The fate, right? Okay, so there's an equivalent story in the Hebrew Bible, which is very interesting. I'll tell it to you so you can really see the illustration of the, the resistance that we have. So this is a warrior in ancient Israel. Uh, he was kind of an outcast and then he became a captain, a, a warrior. And um, he was trying to build his name, build his reputation. He was not really popular when he was young. He was bullied when he was young. So he's really trying to build himself. So he, he prays God and he says, listen, if you deliver me, I mean, if you deliver these people into my hands, right? If I'm able to conquer them, I promise you, I make an oath, right? First thing comes out of my house when I come home, I will offer it up to you in sacrifice. His oath. Okay, he goes to war, defeats the enemy, crushes them, comes home. He's eager to come home, celebrate his victory. The promise is there in the back of his mind. First thing that runs out of his house, right? He will offer it to God. First thing that runs out of his house, guess who? Worst possible thing, worst. Child. His daughter, his only daughter, runs out to meet him. She's so happy that he. she's running with a tambourine, right? She's so happy to see him, so happy. And now he is crushed and he falls to his knees and he is completely destroyed. And he sees her and he says, why have you done this, my daughter? Now I must keep my oath, right? And the, the text is very secretive what happens, right? We don't know how it turns out, but she says, let me go with my friends and roam the hills one last time and then do to me what you want. And we don't know how the story ends, but it probably doesn't end good, right? So this is the typical, right? I can't turn back. I made this oath, right, to God. And this is the this is the illusion we have, right? Several, we have Oedipus, we have this guy's name is Jephthah, for those who want to read up on him, right? This warrior, very famous warrior quoted in philosophy a lot. Kierkegaard also mentions him right this is the prototype of the hero right oedipus Jephthah. this is the hero that goes is talking about always right oedipus. these are the people who are locked in their destinies right who are locked in the course that they have taken they are prisoners of their own actions right and rosenzweig is saying no the gate of revelation is always there, open. You can always turn around and cross the gate, right? At any point of your life. Um, okay. So um, let's just look really quick at 180 to talk about this uh, hero figure that we need to avoid if we want to cross the gate <laughs> of revelation. Um, two man, last paragraph. Yeah. Um, so do you see the last paragraph count? One, two, three, four, five, six. He must also. Who is there? Six. <laughs> Good thing Sanchez Bell, are you there? Um, six from the last paragraph, top of the last paragraph. Who else is there? Wave at me. Page 180, last paragraph, six from the top of the last paragraph. Is Sanchez the only one following in the book? Who else is there? Just in the section. Uh, it's called the soul defiance. Um, six lines down, he must also, who's there? Yes, okay, good. He must also, so talking about the hero, right? Oedipus, Jephthah. He must also in his enclosedness begin to open up in order to learn to hear God's word, right? The question, where are you? To gaze upon the light of God. Now here's what stops us, right? From entering, from returning through the gate of, um, uh, what is it, revelation, right? Defiance and character, hubris and daemon had united in him and had made him a mute self turned in upon himself. Now that he emerges from himself, the forces that formed him also now unfold again, right? So very often we are too proud to turn around, <laughs> right? And that is what stops us from accessing our true selves. We are too proud or too desperate <laughs> to turn around, right? We've made an oath with ourselves to run that course and we're going to stick with it because we feel it's too late. And there's that stupid proverb, you made the bed, now sleep in it. Why? You made the bed, run away from the bed. You don't have to sleep in it. Yes. I would actually disagree. I think most of the reason people feel like they can't change 
is not because of pride or that, you know, I'm already doing this. It's more so of either putting it off saying, I'll do it when we get closer to that point, or it's too hard to. Okay, there, and what makes it hard? I'm curious. Tell us a little bit. It on the situation, um, but I think it's having to change, having to alter the way you've been doing things for a long time, and people, I think people get too familiar. Okay, and why, why would it be so hard to change? I'm just curious. Let's go a little deeper. So give us an example. Um, my grandma, she has poor health, not because she's older, but more because she of her decision-making and how she's chosen to handle her health. Um, <laughs> and because of this, she just keeps getting worse, right? Not doing the things that could possibly extend her life. Right, and she knows, she's heard the question, right? But, right, so we do get used to the, the path of perdition, right? We get used to it, it's familiar, this crazy road that we've built for ourselves, right? And the, But again, right, we're missing the question, we're missing the true self, right? Now, um, I wanna say one more thing before we do a little exercise. Um, this, and I wanna be much more uh, personal in, in this last uh, point I'm gonna make, right? The question, where are you? According to Rosenzweig is actually connected to love. To divine love right so let me explain exactly what, what what he means by that right question where are you is not just curiosity it's not just you know warning <laughs> or threatening right it is a gaze of love so let me explain um the way that i came to this uh idea or this experience was through a story which i'm gonna tell you uh, this is a story of a uh, a very old Stradivarius violin. Anybody know what is a Stradivarius violin? What kind of violin it is? A Stradivarius, anybody know? It's, a, it's one of the most expensive violins in the world. It's hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? Um, and it's, it's a brand from Italy, right? So there was this old violin that was sitting on a shelf in, um, in a very kind of ordinary house. And it had been there for years and it had collected dust and it was just there looking kind of, you know, pretty wretched. So it was full of dust and it looked, you know, like old thing. And one day comes in um, to this house visiting uh, a world-class violinist, right? And, you know, he's having tea, he's enjoying the time with those people. And then his gaze falls upon this dusty violin, right? Immediately he's able to perceive because he's a world-renowned musician the value of this instrument beneath the dust, right? He's able to see beyond the dust because he knows the instrument. He's played instruments like that before. And he identifies that it's one of the most costly instruments in the world. And he says to the person in the house, what are you doing with such an instrument? Oh, they're like, oh, that old thing? That's just an old thing my grandfather gave me. It's been sitting here. You want it? <laughs> He's like, well, you know, do you, are you aware what this instrument really is worth, right? Um, and, and, you know, the, the, the violence reveals that this is a, one of the most costly instruments in the world and the other guy doesn't believe him and just gives it to him, right? That's a story. I was struck with how close this story comes to the gaze that God throws upon us at times, right? People see us and we see ourselves sometimes covered with dust. I don't know if you've reached a time in your life and you will eventually, where you realize I am just covered with dust. <laughs> I have lost my brilliance. I have lost my glow. I have lost my light along the way. And here comes the question, where are you? Which implies, I see you. I see the true you. I see all your glory. Where is it? That's the gaze of love. Are you following? Right, when God looks at you like that and you can sense that someone is seeing the glory that has been covered up by the dust. That is the, the gaze of love that you're experiencing, whether you believe in God or not. Anytime you get a sense that I feel that my glory is perceived, right? Either by my inner eye or by the gaze of God, beneath the dust, beneath what everyone thinks about me, beneath what people say about me, someone sees the true me and calls it forth with the question, where are you? That is the divine gaze of love. Are you following? So that's an experience, extremely intimate experience with God, right? This can be the first experience you ever have, right? If you've never had an experience with God, the feeling of the gaze of God 
looking and seeing the buried glory, <laughs> right, that you have forgotten, that people have covered up and traumatized, right? That, that gaze that you feel is the essence of the love gaze of God, right? So that question, where are you, actually hides a deeper question or a deeper uh, gaze, which is, where are you? Where is your glory? I see your glory, and I'm wondering, where has it gone, right? Are you following? So that's what he's talking about when he says that, where are you, is the experience of the love of God, right? It's the experience of the divine gaze, which sees buried beneath the dust, the hidden glory that no one else sees, right? But the creator himself, right? So that's what he says here, going now to the question of love, right? 183. Um, yeah. So I'm in the second paragraph, last sentence, for it is only. So who is with me? 183, second paragraph, last sentence, one wave, two waves, thank you. So then he says this, right? Um, we can read a little further up. God does not stop loving and the soul never stops being loved. The soul receives the peace of God and not God, the peace of the soul. And God makes a present of himself to the soul and not the soul to God. For it is only in the love of God pouring into the rock of the self that the flower of the soul begins to grow, right? That question, where are you, right? Is what he's talking about is the love of God pouring into the rock of the self, right? Looking at the flower of the soul and calling it forth right? Anytime you hear or you sense there is a better me that needs to come out, that is the divine gaze of love, right? Let me say that again, right? Anytime you feel I'm better than this, <laughs> right? I am better than what people say about me. I am more than what people think about me. I am more than where I am right now in my circumstance, right? Anytime you feel that strong urge to affirm your glory underneath the, the dust, this is provoked by the divine gaze of love in your life with it right that's what he's saying the soul blossoms right under that gaze um and then he says this uh, before this man was turned in on himself mute and devoid of feeling only now is he beloved soul right so the question where are you hides is kind of the the question that hides the deep love of god for us right the gaze of god upon us and again right this is an experience you can have whether you believe in god or not right anytime you you have a sense of your true self your true glory and how you've lost it right that's the the workings of the divine gaze of love right that is the effect of the divine gaze of love on you right whether you believe in god or not okay any questions before we do a quick exercise in the next five minutes? Okay, here's what you're gonna do. 